This is episode 87 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host, and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world. Sometimes you just get lucky. Like that time I was searching the internet for info on magician Peter Samuelson and accidentally Googled movie producer Peter Samuelson with a U. Not only did we get a great interview from magician Peter Samuelson, but I found out that Peter Samuelson has contributed over a billion dollars to charities, and we all benefited from that additional interview. Well, this is one of those. I first discovered Lily Walters as a face painter. I checked out her website and found out that she's an innovator in the face painting business. Then we went to lunch because she happens to live in my area, and lo and behold, I found out that she had a super successful speaking business and wrote the book on professional speaking. What a treat! In this interview, we talk about both and how and why Lily became a face painter and who's that one celeb she now represents in the speaking business. Full of great information and terrific stories of triumph. This interview is amazing. Enjoy the show. Fun fact number 27. John used to do triathlons. Welcome to the Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guest today is known nationwide as The Face Painter. She's the author of many face painting books, including Face Painting Boot Camp in a Book, Day of the Dead, Face Painters, Tools and Tricks, and many more. But what you didn't know is that Lily has had a very successful speaking business and has written many respected books on the subject. Author, teacher, and artist, variety artist, I give you Lily Walters. Woo hoo! Boy, she sounds impressive. She's amazing, huh? <laughs> well, unless when you're introducing me, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about all your books. You've written a, a bunch of books. Now, we were talking a little before we got on here. What was your first book? Well, we used to publish anthologies. Uh, I was in business with my mother, and we did anthologies that featured famous uh, or up-and-coming, aspiring, whatever, professional speakers. And okay. they would have what's called their signature story, and each one would have a chapter in it. So that was probably the first thing I did, and I can't remember the first one of those I did, but I think it was probably around 1990. Wow. Yeah, and I did three or four of those because, you know, we published them. Sure. And I'd like to say it was because I was so genius and amazing, and let's get to the truth of it, which is probably they needed another chapter. So, <laughs> <laughs> here, write something. So, you just started writing then, huh? Yeah. You know, I've always liked to write, and I think it came from my mother, who very much loved to write, loved, loved, loved to write, and she, in high school, was on, you know, when took journalism and did the yearbook and that sort of thing. And I, that just spilled over onto me as I was growing up. All right. Now, what was your first book by yourself? Well, let's back it up and say the first one that was a major book, which was by McGraw, no, by Prentice Hall, which is now Simon Schuster, which I think actually is now Penguin. It's quite interesting what publishing houses do. I'm pretty sure right now we're with Penguin. And that was Speak and Grow Rich. And although I really did write that book on my own, it's co-done with you know, the many, many years of experience that my mother had in the professional speaking industry. Yeah, I've read Think and Grow Rich. How do those parallel? Or do they? Um, no, the, uh, Napoleon Hill's book was very, um, a little more esoteric and very much not meat and nuts and bolts, you know, and ours was, hey, you need to get this kind of a demo tape and you need to start like this with your demo tape. And, you know, really you need to have some kind of a back in the day it was flyer and you need to have this is what needs to be in your intro letter or your intro email to people it was it was much more nuts and bolts but my mother knew napoleon hill oh. and he had the most wonderful quote that he gave her when she was on a show called i want to say it's what's my line but i actually think it was the competitive show to what's my line give me a break mm. this has been a long time ago right okay <laughs> she was on it because she had written the first book ever written for women in sales mm. To be fair, it was the first book written by a woman for women in sales. And so she was fairly famous and she was on the speaking circuit. And that started all of the stuff about the speaking world because she was going around the country speaking. Is that how you got involved in speaking? Yes, because she was a professional speaker. 
All right. And where did you speak? Where did I speak? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, actually, I've, I've did quite a bit of speaking, too. But I mean, she was the speaker and then I was running the Speakers Bureau. And then I started writing the books and we wrote together Speak and Grow Rich. And then that led to me writing the next one, I think, was Secrets of Successful Speakers. Now, that one was on presentation skills, and that was all me. Oh, let's go back a little bit about, you mentioned speakers bureaus. Now, uh -huh. I know what they are, but tell us what a speaker bureau is. A speakers bureau is like a travel agency through the world of professional speakers. There is being an agent and or a manager, which means that I just I just work with you, John. I'm, I'm your girl. Hey. You know, and I, I help you with things. And... and we had mentioned that I actually, that's what I do anymore is I only work with one celebrity speaker. When you're a speaker's bureau, we had a database of, you know, like 10,000, 30,000 people. Wow. Yeah. And, but they didn't rely on their whole income from us. I mean, they might have registered themselves with, you know, a hundred speakers bureaus. Mm -hmm. So a buyer would call us up and say, gee, we're looking for, you know, something about success motivation and they need to have a, had a background in whatever. And so then we yeah. typed that into the database and off we'd go. Did you run that or? I, I did. I did. That was my, my part of the company is I ran the speakers grow. But most people don't realize if you want to be a professional speaker, they think I went to Toastmasters and I'm really good. I can articulate and I can, I can look people in the eye and I'm a good speaker. And yeah, a lot of people are good speakers, but the trick is getting people to pay you to be a good speaker. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to be a speaker's bureau and all those people who are saying, well, but I have this great talk on loving puppies and, <laughs> and you know, whatever huge corporate company doesn't want to hire me for their annual meeting to talk about that. And well, yeah, that's true. So what would you say is the secret of becoming a successful speaker? I know that's a huge subject, but do you have one or two uh, hints, ideas? Okay, well, first you've got to have a topic that people are willing to buy. Mm -hmm. So, and if you have a topic like loving puppies, okay, then you need to, you know, write eBooks about it, regular books about it. You need to do workshops because no one can fire. If you want to go hire a meeting room and, you know, put out your shingle and, and put out a bunch of flyers. No one can fire you from that because you are your own boss. Yeah. So do it that way. And frankly, people like, oh my God, his name's gone from my thing. Um, but like the most famous motivational speaker, big, huge, tall guy, used to live down Tony Diego. Robbins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You know, he, when he would do one of those workshops, we're talking like 400,000. I mean, he oh. made a lot of money because he had a whole bunch of people come in paying a lot to be there. Yeah. You know, he like never needed to have anybody say, oh, let me give you $5,000 to come do our keynote. Because although many people do hire him to do that. <laughs> Not for $5,000 though. <laughs> no, no, no. He's moved, he's, he's moved past that. I think so a little bit. Anyway. Oh, you know what? I was going to make a point like an yeah. hour ago where you were, yeah. we were talking about um, Napoleon Hill and yes. the book Think and Grow Rich and how did it go with Speak and Grow Rich, the book I wrote. And uh, my mother had just done that TV show, whatever it was, and he wrote her the most beautiful letter to say, Dottie. Oh, that's right. My mother was Dottie Walters. Yes. How does it feel to have blown inspirational stardust to the world? That's and great. so, you know, we, I think he had passed by the time we had done Speaking Grudge, but we asked the, um, the either the heirs or the, the business, whoever was left, and, you know, we'd like to use that on the cover, of course. Sure. That we did, and that was nice. And that was that. Other than that connection, really no connection, because the other is very much you've got to try harder, and you've got to put aside those negative thoughts, and that mm -hmm. kind of you know more the touchy feely stuff. And the book we wrote was very practical. Now you were in Chicken Soup for the Soul. You wrote an article for them. I did actually. My mother was in the first one, uh -huh. and then yeah, our friends uh, Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield went to all these professional speakers and said, let us, let us publish your signature story because every professional speaker has got at least one, you know, yep. you've got the, but again, the puppy story of this speaker and you've got the one about <laughs> the puppy oh, story, <laughs> right? Or the starfish on the beach. Oh my God. I've heard that darn starfish on the beach. And somebody started that originally. It was their signature store, their signature story. Mm. So they went and they said, okay, signature stories and they put that together into the first chicken soup of the soul and my mom was in that well then they came back and they said more 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 and so it was the second one for chicken soup of the soul so i was in an accident when i was 10 years old lost a big chunk of my left hand and oh. 
afterwards learned how to type. Oh. And with one hand. My mother, one of her signature stories is this wonderful motivational story about how she wasn't going to let me not be able to type because remember I said she was the writer. She was yeah. the, you know, it was very important to her to type. By God, I mean, she typed grocery lists on this old Underwood typewriter. She typed, she typed, she typed. It was unthinkable that I wasn't going to learn how to type. Hmm. She did this lovely story about, you know, how she was motivational with that. And then I did a follow-up story to it about how I went into a doctor's office one day and the nurse, I was in for something totally different. I had strep throat or something, you know, and this nurse came up to me who was dealing with the other part. And she said, can I ask you something personal? I thought, you know, I'm sitting here in a naked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, it's hard to get more personal. I did not yeah. say any of that. Didn't say any of that out loud, of course, but I said, yes, of course. And she said, she um, had just had an ultrasound and her baby, she was obviously pregnant. Her baby was going to be born without a hand. Mm -hmm. And she needed to know what it meant to me. What what it meant to me now is that I was an adult. Yeah. Just what it meant. That's all she said was, what did it mean to you? Yeah. And it was a, an intriguing and very important question not to be taken lightly. And so that was what that story was about that I wrote. So, so she tells her story about how she got me to type. And then I, you know, tell the story about what it, this woman and talking to me. And it was nice. So wait, what, what's the answer to that? You, you got me on the edge of my seat. Oh, <laughs> about what did I say to her? Yeah. Mind you, taking, taking a month to write the story is going to be much better than what I'm going to do now 20 years later telling you. But, <laughs> you know, I told her it's going to be about her and not really about her child because her child is normal. Her child is, is who her child is and is going to be as happy as she is. Hmm. And the, the truth of the matter is the hardest things for me was the, when I was in that accident, was the tragedy for my mother. Oh. It was horrible for her. That was a horrible burden and made me feel insecure. Mm. So, but my dad, it never made any difference to him. I, of course, he was horribly hurt by it. I don't mean that, but, but it made no difference about me and about the, I, I was not injured in his eyes. Right. So my message to her was, look, your child is not, injured your child is not different because any 10 kids you put together they're all different yeah one likes asparagus and one likes broccoli and it's just you know one's got blonde hair and one's one's got dark hair it just doesn't make any difference we're yeah. just all different it doesn't define you no it just doesn't it's only going to define your child if it you let it define him right as you were talking i thought of a, a, so many different things first <laughs> I learned to type when I was young too. And I had a typing teacher, ironically, and I wonder if this is the reason she took this name. Uh, her name was Miss Underwood. And you mentioned Underwood typewriting, right? <laughs> and I wonder if she changed her name. And here's the reason why I wonder that, because I, I assume she or any of her relatives aren't listening to this, hopefully. We found out when I was in high school learning how to type that our typewriter teacher was in Playboy. Oh, Interesting. Yeah, and I wonder if she changed her name. And now people are Googling her probably. Um, I wonder if she changed her name to Miss Underwood because that's the name of a typewriter back then. I have absolutely no idea, but it suddenly came, came flooding back. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, learning how to type, and we put a piece of paper over our hands. Yeah. So that way we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to watch the, our hands or the keys when we were learning how to type. Right. Yeah, that was the big thing. But you wrote an entire book on, on or, or one-handed typing. It's a typing manual. Oh. See, what, what happened was when Chicken Soup for the Soul became this mega thing, my mother wrote this story about how I overcame and, and I went on to be a really fast typist. And then all of a sudden, when Chicken Soup for the Soul was selling in the millions and millions, I started getting these phone calls like every day. People saying, where's that typing manual? Where's that typing manual? And we kept saying, oh, well, it's IBM. It's IBM. Just ask IBM. I mean, it was pretty important back in 68. <laughs> yeah. It's really important now that you know how to type. You know, it's mandatory. Certainly everybody knows about it. But what had happened was that everybody didn't know about it. Yeah. And people were getting into instead of instead of letting you type really fast on a normal computer so you can feel absolutely normal and competitive with all of your other friends. Let's put you on some weird 
one-handed keyboard thing that, by the way, you won't type as fast on, and it's going to cost you like $1,500 and will make you feel weird and inferior and different than everybody else. Is that what they did in, back then? Not back in 68, but it's what they did by the time Chicken Silver the Soul came out and I was getting all these phone calls. Okay. That's crazy. Everybody's got to be using this typing manual now, uh, but they weren't. They were trying to foister people off on. So I probably single-handedly changed that trend right on back to what the blankety blank are you guys thinking of? Mm -hmm. Let me speak as that adult now who's written however many books I'd written at that point and typed every single page about myself. What are you thinking? But there, it was not easy to get the typing manual any longer. So I wrote one because mm. it's what I do. I write things. <laughs> You're like, hey, it's not around. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. And plus, who better than somebody else with two hands to actually say, well, here's the drills that would help somebody do it because that's what a typing manual is. That's, let's do number A. I mean, you know, number one and let's do number A. Oh, yeah. Use this finger and reach over there. Now let's do it 700 times. And yeah. So it was easy to do, and I sold a whole ton of them. And yeah, nowadays, I mean, my kids are are twenty one and twenty seven, and they both type like maniacs, and they never took a typing class in their life. They just grew up with it, you know, with computers. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. And they have the fastest thumbs in the West, you know. Yes. Well, and if they had learned how to type, they actually would have less strain on their hands, and they would be faster than what they're doing right now. Probably true. But most people don't, and there you go. That's a whole different discussion for a different day. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, since we're talking about the typing manual, whenever I write anything, because I had access to all of these professional speakers and people who are wonderful, brilliantly motivational. So I like to put quotes from these famous people into my stuff because it makes me look like I'm way more important than I am, right? Kind of like this podcast. There you go. Me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would went to, so I went to Bob Dole, um, you know, Senator Bob Dole, because, you know, he only had one arm he could use. and. Who else? Well, anyway, that led me to kind of, a, kind of a, I think, beautiful story. I was walking through my living room going, honey, or to my husband, I'm writing this one hand typing manual. Who do you know that's famous that only has the use of one hand? Yeah. And he said, well, this guy right here on TV. At that exact moment that I asked that exact question, baseball player Jim Abbott was... Mm -hmm. And this was past his playing days, right? Because this had to be in 2000. And he okay. retired in, I think, 98. So somebody was doing a story about Jim Abbott. I mean, what are the chances of that happening? Yeah. I said, okay, who's he? And because I do not follow sports of any kind. And I just don't care. And he said, oh, he's a really famous baseball player. And I said, but he's a pitcher. I mean, he's just throwing the ball. You only need one hand to throw the ball. Why, why is that important? <laughs> he's, just, he's a pitcher. He's just throwing the ball. That's all he's doing. Well, he's just throwing <laughs> the ball, but why do you care that he only has one hand? Because yeah. he only had one hand, right? I mean, because he's throwing, and he's, honey, when they throw the ball to the man with the piece of wood, he hits it back really, really hard and really, really fast. <laughs> yes. And then the man who's out there who just threw the ball has got to have a glove on his hand to catch it. Well, Jim Abbott just threw the ball and only had like two seconds to figure out a way to slip that glove onto the hand he just threw with because he only had the one hand. He said, and that's why he's famous because that's really, really hard. Yeah. I did not know that. I'm, I'm willing to be impressed with that. And evidently people who actually play baseball are very, very impressed with that. Yeah. I remember being impressed by it. Well, there you go. And yeah. many, many people are because that's evidently extremely hard to do. And he does it very well. You know, he was gold medalist in the Olympics and everything. So Jim Abbott, I, I am Jim Abbott. So that's what I do now. I just work with Jim Abbott as far as the professional speaking career. Then, of course, I have this avocation of face painting where I've written all those books and yada, yada. But he is the he you were talking about when you saying when you were saying I represent right. him. Right. That's it. That's all. On my whole speaking world, that's all I do. And wow, what a different life it is to just book a celebrity than it is to constantly be doing marketing and, you know, buying mailing lists and, and, you know, trying to do different website promotions and all the things you have to do if you are a professional speaker and you're not a celebrity. Well, tell us why he's such a great speaker. Well, because he's famous. <laughs> <laughs> that helps that helps your job too huh i mean it really does because the truth of the matter is you can be just caca doo doo if you're a celebrity people are going to pay you to come to their meeting that that's the honest to god truth yeah if you're you know clinton or bush or obama all of whom are good speakers by the way but i'm just 
saying the people with that kind of a name that everybody knows, it doesn't matter how good you are as a speaker, they want you to come. Mm -hmm. Then you get somebody like Jim Abbott, who, although many people go, uh, who, who Jim Abbott never heard of him. And if you say, you know, he was the one handed baseball player who was the lead pitcher for the angels and also for the Yankees. Oh, yeah. him, him. And then all of a sudden that, so he's enough of a celebrity that um, he's just easy to book. But what's your question? I've gone off. Why Jim? Why Jim? I, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Why is Jim good? One, well, one, he's a good speaker. Uh, since I had quite the background in helping people be good speakers and, you know, wrote all those books and stuff about it, I like to, with very little humilité, say that I was able to help him a little bit. And he's very nice about acknowledging that I kind of helped rough out those edges and help him get some ideas. But really the wonderfulness of Jim Abbott is because he works and works and works at it, just as he did to learn how to, to flip that glove onto the other hand. He puts that kind of focus into everything he does. The other reason is he's got this amazing story. Yeah. When he was born, his dad didn't even know what to do. He was so distressed and thinking that he had committed some horrible evil. And that's why he had a child that was, born with a, you know, a birth defect. And they tried to force him to wear this big monster prosthetic thing that prosthetics are awful. And people with one hand, really, we just don't need it. Okay. Another story, another day, but, mm -hmm. but they forced that on him. And so he had his own share of stuff to overcome and he did overcome it. He's mom and apple pie and hot dogs. And I've never heard him now what it's been, what, 20 years. Yeah. That man has never said, I think one time he said, I think he said shit I, one time oh, uh -oh. 20 years and we deal with a lot of difficult situations. Oh my gosh, you've got to get to that keynote speech and whatever. And the plane's been delayed and there's a snowstorm and it's stuff where there's frustration going on that a lesser person like me would have unwholesome words proceeding from my mouth. Oh, me too. But not Jim. He's just a superior human being. It's not just wow. about his base baseball. And it's a great story about how he, had these, you know, very difficult odds. He met them, he conquered them. And we've never not had a standing ovation mm. in all these years, always. Every single person that works with him says, oh my gosh, he's just so humble and so caring. And anybody who comes up to him and needs an autograph and wants something, bam, he's on it. He's, oh, he's absolutely on it. He's just a nice guy. That's great. And when I first started with him, he wanted to, um, I, I wanted, because I, I did his website for him and all that stuff. And so I'm starting to get calls and emails from parents saying, hey, I, you know, my child's lost, uh, been in an accident and, and lost a leg or, mm -hmm. you know, born without whatever it is or has CP or, you know, MS or just whatever heartbreaking story it was. And we were just wondering, could maybe you just send a note? And, mm -hmm. and I said, you know what, Jim, let me just scan your autograph. I'll just write these notes. They're never going to be any wiser. They'll treasure it. And he said, oh, no, Lily. No, no. Not for these kids. Not for these kids. So every single one of those requests, he sends out, you know, a signed photograph and he, a personal handwritten letter. Wow. And I can't tell you the hundreds and hundreds of people who tell me, you know, we framed that. We, we framed it 20 years ago. We framed that and it's still on the wall. And now my, my child is having a child. And it's, he's just, he's just a superior guy and he doesn't want me to do any marketing, none. So what a change from the world I used to be involved with where it was, you know, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because if you're a celebrity, people call you. Yeah. It's a matter of saying, you know, no, gosh, my daughter's volleyball game is that weekend. So I don't want to go. I'm going, wow. Okay. What a dream. What a dream he must be. He's a dream. It is. I am living the dream of professional speakers because not only is he just a superior person, he's kind, he's generous. He's oh. so nice to me and wonderful. I mean, it was just so much different than that world of that pound. Well, you know, Oh yeah. you know, any variety artist, you know what it's like out there pounding that pavement and always looking for the next gig. You betcha. And Jim is not, he's just looking for the ones he wants to do because it happens to fit with his schedule working around, you know, spending time with his children. Sure. And you know what? He's unique in that because everyone I knew in the speaking industry, my mother would have left me bleeding in the street if she had a gig. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. That might be a tiny exaggeration, but not so much. <laughs>
<laughs> that's okay. <laughs> In fact, uh, this uh, when you were talking about celebs, it reminded me of a, of a story that was told to me uh, by, by another speaker, as a matter of fact, that he had worked at a college or had heard this story from a college that hired both Snooky from – from uh, oh, from Jersey Shore, right? Yeah, yeah. And on the same weekend, they hired Maya Angelou. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and they paid Snooky a ton of money. I don't remember the figures, some forty, fifty thousand dollars or something like that. And paid Maya Angelou, you know, five or ten thousand, something like that. And all the students were in a big uproar because, of course, Maya Angelou. Right. But you know, everybody showed up for Snooky. No matter how good or bad she is, and very few people showed up for Maya Angelou. Yeah, that speaks to what it is. It is what it is, you know. If you're trying, and if you're the person trying to fill the seats, you're going to go with that celebrity person that's going to fill the seats. I get mm -hmm. it. I get it. Yeah, good, bad, or otherwise. Yep. 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 All, right, all right. Let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's okay. talk about your face painting business. <laughs> you do a lot of face painting. You've written a number of face painting books. What took you from speaking? The face painting. The middle of the middle portion of there is Jim Abbott that we already talked about. Because I yes. went from running the speakers bureau and everything to Jim Abbott, where all of a sudden I had time on my hands. Where before it was almost seven days a week. And of course I was speaking around the country or well, around the world. I did Australia and South Africa and um, uh, Brazil. I did stuff in and anyway, and all that was great, but it's 24 seven. I mean, you know, yeah, you know what that world is about. And then um, my mother actually passed away and I had had Jim Abbott and I said, Jim, I just want to work with you. I mean, that's how, that's how I got that gig. I called him. I said, Jim, I'm only working for you now. And he went, uh, <laughs> um, I said, okay, here's how it's going to be. I'm making a website now. Uh, oh, uh, so, so there you go. And then, you know, he's too nice to fire me. So that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> but anyway, so now I have time on my hands. I got involved in our local church and the church was involved with doing this uh, community festival for people who retired from the clergy and they needed some money because they'd given their lives and their money to, you know, the service of others. And so they do this huge festival every year and they said, we're going to have you volunteer. I offered to volunteer and we're going to have you carry packages. And I said, great. And then they called me a few days later and said, you know, you're crafty. We're going to have you do face painting. I said, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got no clue. <laughs> None at all. One thing led to another, and uh, that first thing was the worst disaster in the history of face painters. I said, let's fix this because I'm a fixer and an organizer. And, you know, we downloaded pictures. I downloaded pictures and figured out how to do it. And that yeah. was about 13 years ago. Mm. It turned out I had an aptitude for it. And probably more than that, I'm, I'm a good teacher. And yeah. I love to teach. So once I started to get better, then I started to teach. And then, of course, I had to write a book about it because, you know, I write books. Because that's what you do. That's what I do. And so I started writing books about it and then another book and another book and did conventions around and the, what you do when you get. But really, it was just because it was fun and people pay you to do it. And the nice thing about it is as an art form, when I get into painting a picture, right? Mm -hmm. You got to have somebody who wants a long commitment to buying that picture from you yeah. because they're going to put it on their wall. Yeah. And that's a big commitment. But if you're going to do art on somebody's face, they only have to have a couple hour commitment. Right. They're usually much happier to buy that from you. Now, of course, the prices are different. I get that. but mm -hmm. And plus, you don't have to be as good because for face painters, a little tip for the beginner face painter, God did the hard part. You know, it's not like you're trying to draw a portrait. Because God already did the portrait. Yeah. You're just putting some highlights here and there. And the thing is now 3D glitter and jewels and gems. And uh, I'm I'm kind of the moving force behind that whole 3D thing. So if you ever see a face, face painted person and they have an actual crown on their forehead that's got jewels and stuff, you'll say, Lily got that going, didn't she? Wait, so you started that whole thing? Um, kind very of? influential. Let's say very influential. Because certainly we were all sticking jewels on people how it is right now with the whole 3d thing of the way it's going and these big crowns that are on people. Yeah. Pr probably you need to give a nod my way. And did you write a book about that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew that. I, I looked it up. I saw it. <laughs> I did. That was a loaded question. I know. I know. <laughs> but, but it's so much fun. You know, it's just fun and it doesn't take 
a lot of my time. Now, mind you, a lot of people make a living out of being a face painter. Oh, yeah. In fact, I try to convince a lot of people that are going through college, face painting, uh, magic. You know, it's a great living, especially when you're trying to put yourself through college. It's great short-term money. Yeah that you can make on a weekend and it's you make a lot more face painting and doing that type of thing than working at Starbucks. Yeah. Waiting tables. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I would imagine that magic just as face painting, it, it sounds like it's going to be easy and, but it, there is an off little bit of a learning curve. And my guess is that um, magic is going to take you a little longer to learn than face painting. Yeah. Maybe the interesting thing though about magic face painting, the whole thing is that, not only do you have to do the face painting and the magic or the, the juggling, whatever it is that you do, but you also have to market it. Yeah, you're right back to that again, aren't we? And you have to sell it. <laughs> if people like, if you've heard the famous quote, now dang, who said it? It's gone from my brain, but it, success is, I, oh, Thomas Edison. Uh, success is 99%, uh, success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. That's right. And, and people don't get it. They just want, just let me register with a speaker's bureau. Let me just have an agent who's just going to take me and send me out everywhere. Yeah, well, you know, you and the other 7,000 people who'd like that to happen. You've got to be the driving force. You've got to be out there pounding that pavement. There's no way to get around it. And I do pound the pavement as a face painter. I just don't have to for Jim Abbott because, you know, he's famous. Because he's Jim Abbott. He's Jim Abbott. <laughs> yeah. I just moved down to Orange County. I'm a neighbor with the very famous John, of course. That's what I hear. Yes, 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 yes. You know, in my old world where I lived up there in Claremont, which is uh, farther north in the Los Angeles County area of California, I was a big deal. You know, I was hired by big companies and everything because I pounded the pavement when I got started. Mm -hmm. So in, in that little sliver of variety artists, I got to be famous. Well, now here that I've moved down to Orange County, it's like, who? Lily who? Nobody cares. Well, not nobody. I'm, but, you know, slowly, because I'm working very hard at it, buying the advertising, doing the things you got to do. And you know when you really need to do the marketing the most? When you think you're on top. Yeah, that, that's a big mistake that people, people make all the time. Yep. Is that when you're on top, you have a tendency to get lazy and say, hey, I'm on top. I don't have to do <laughs> anything. And then by the time you lose that business, it's too late. That's right. You have, to wait, you have to wait. You have to do the marketing and then wait another year. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, you know, one of the reasons that I have you on this podcast is because of your marketing. Oh, well, there you go. My daughter, when she was, I don't know, maybe 17, maybe four or five years ago, uh, she took one of your classes from an email blast that you did. So I discovered you from friends of mine, and then since then, I've received different email blasts from you, and I said, oh, Lily Walters, I don't know her, but you know what? I think I'd like to talk to her. She sounds like somebody that's a go-getter that I need to talk to. Well, thank you, and I'm glad you, you reached out. It's, it's fun, but really, my, my main love is, yes, I love to do the art, but gosh, I love to do the teaching. I, I, I do this event once a year now um, in Las Vegas, so we run a you know, a meeting room and um, I bring in 40 people from around the country mm -hmm. and we sit there for two days and work our butts off. I call it a face painting boot camp. You know, I'm really proud of it. Another hard lesson that I've come by, I used to do a ton of classes all over the place. One, you're training your competition, which, you know, if you'd rather be a teacher than a face painter, that's okay. That, that's okay because I'm, I'm happier doing the teaching anyway. Uh, but by doing it in Las Vegas, which is for people listening to us other, in other places, that's the next state over. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just bringing people in there. One, I get people who are really, really intense about wanting to learn. And it's much easier to just bring a bunch of people into one spot than to do four different events with 10 people in each one. Yeah. Well, a couple of things about that. First, yeah, when, when you're training somebody in Vegas, you know, you may not be necessarily training your local competition. You know, you, you're training somebody in Illinois or New York. Right. Or, exactly. or some other area. Sure. And, and secondly, no matter how much you train somebody, no matter no matter how much you teach somebody, they can't be you. Right. They can't do the exact same things that you're doing. Right. And that person who wants to hire so I, I charge hundred bucks an hour to be a face painter, which is actually turns out a little low for Orange County mm -hmm. because there's it's a more affluent area than I came from. I did not know this. I thought they I came from an affluent area, but evidently. It's even more so in Orange County. Who knew? Orange County um, crazy. Orange County crazy, like they yep. say. I didn't even know where I was going with this. Um, <laughs> I 
<laughs> it was going to be the best point of any podcast you'd ever done, John. And yes, right. ever. Ever. <laughs> ever. All right. Well, we'll start. We'll start again. Is there some sort of secret or a secret of making someone happy? Because I know you do. You do tons of face painting, tons of kids, a bunch of adults. You mean as a face painter? As, as a, a face, face painter, painter, how do I make them happy? Yeah. How do you make the person that you're painting happy? Okay. If they're children, let's start with the children. If it's a girl, here's the big secret. You ready to write this one down, listeners? Do it. Gl glitter. <laughs> you can turn out the worst poop in the world. And if you put a lot of glitter on it, of which, by the way, I have, in every color of the rainbow, I have six different types of glitter. And each one of them in six different colors. I mean, in, in all the colors of the rainbow. In my kit, because it doesn't matter what I do. If I put glitter on it, I am Michelangelo. <laughs> That's great. And, and, and those jewels I was telling you about. My big contribution is we make them into clusters. And like I said, they're made into kind of a little crown situation. So I stick that baby on, which is a four second process and put glitter around it. And oh my God, she's just amazing. <laughs> bing, bing, boom. Wow. And I, I honestly, then people tell me all the time, I've, oh, I've seen a lot of base painters, but I've never seen anybody with that kind of talent. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for that. But you know, I'm sure it's the same way with magic, isn't it? You've got that big thing to go, whoa. And really it's a, one of the tricks that isn't, doesn't require the skill and the. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've gotten rid of a number of tricks that are really complex and, and really take a lot of effort. And some of the easiest ones, people are like, wow, that's amazing. It's spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's girls. Well, how about how about boys? Well, and and of course these are huge broad brush strokes because you got the boys who want the glitter and you've got the girls who want the gore. Of course. Uh, but in general, we're still in that place where whatever we're doing with the whole gender thing, come on, it's still you've still got more girls want pink and glitter and more boys want gore yeah. for the most part. So um, th they want a superhero, but they want to be menacing. Then they love it when you just take a little eyebrow and you bring that eyebrow so it's furrowed. Mm. You know, again, they think you're a genius. And it's nothing. It's just a nothing thing to do. Now, having said that, I don't know if you're going to post any pictures of my work with this. I don't know how this works, but there's there's photos of it. I can if you'd like me to. I'd, I'd love to put some on your, on your show notes page if I can. Okay, sure. Absolutely. Okay, we'll talk after this and I'll grab a few. Because there, there is some skill involved. And so I don't want to just be so humble here that there isn't some skill involved. With it, but really the wow factor stuff is the stuff that isn't really very skillful. You know, I mean, if I like for Halloween, I turned this one little girl into a witch. I mean, she was like a 10 year old. Right. And I turned her into a, she wasn't even that. She's like a six year old. And she looked wonderful, just menacing and frightening and green and yellows and, you know, really just not that hard, but there is a skill level to doing things like that. I don't know if you've seen some of these artists that are like street artists and they do things with spray cans and stuff. And I watch them and all of a sudden they've turned out this amazing piece of artwork and it looks so simple. Yeah. Just so simple. And it, so there is some skill level. So I just don't want to entirely say there isn't a learning curve. But, and then adults with the women, it's always about having that big swatch of glitter, chunky glitter on them. Same as smaller kids, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the men, usually I can get by with giving them a tribal tattoo, mm. you know, kind of a Mike Tyson sort of a thing, which is, again, very fast and easy to do. So yeah. it is fun, fun, fun. And, but the real trick, the real difficulty is when you have a huge crowd. I just did this mall event, got this promoter that hires me all the time to do this mall. I don't want to say which mall. Okay. It was hell. It was just frigging hell because Santa came and they had Elsa and they oh, had no. Yeah. So I start off and he says, you know, we, we are going to have you for two hours. And I say, yeah, that's great. And so I go to set up and look up and there's already a line of 40 people. Well, there's uh, logistics involved in getting the person from the line to your chair and to say, and what is it you wanted, honey? And then there's that moment of, um, um, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then doing the thing that's going to make them happy and then getting them out of the chair and getting the next person in. So if you're looking at 40 people in an hour, even getting them in and out of the chair usually is going to take you, if you're lucky, 45 seconds before you start painting. So 
it's a hard thing to do to work that kind of a thing when you've got to have a set of designs that are those high wow factor sorts of things that you know you can get done in 30 seconds because that's all you got. Yeah. The next time I looked up, there was 60 people and I kept yelling down the line, hey guys, Elsa is over there. <laughs> oh no. Santa's down there. And you know, you'd think they were giving away ponies because I've had that exact same situation happen where I cannot see the end of the line. So I can't, they only wanted me there for two hours and I can't even see the end of the line to be able to say, okay, this is the last person. And even if I ran back to the end and say, would you tell the next people that you're the last person? It won't make any difference because people will just keep getting in the line. Yeah. And I've had it before with the parents actually just about come to the blows. They start to have like this fights. <laughs> it's, it's like, this is this is not a good learning moment, parents. I've heard many many stories about this. So it's it's the it isn't the kids that are the problem. It's the parents, right? It's always the parents. It's always the parents that are the problems because the kids are still involved in how do we wait in the line? Who's yeah. first in the line? I mean, they have to do this all day long, every day at school. So they're it. They got it. They got it. It's their parents going. Ugh. Oh, we've been waiting for so long now. And I thought, yeah, geez, I only set up 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> <laughs> probably not. So uh, I know this is kind of a technical question, but how do you end that line if you have 40 oh, people? Do you have, a, do you have a method? Normal. Well, in a normal situation where it isn't that kind of insanity, where there's literally a thousand people mulling around trying to get to Santa and Elsa and all these other people, mm -hmm. normally I can do it no problem because I've got a little sign I kind of hang on the last person and I bribe the last person and I say, how would you like to have the best face painting you've ever had in your life? Something more remarkable, more remarkable than anything you've ever had. Mm. And of course they're going, oh, what? And I say, but you have to promise to wait to the end. And you have to tell everybody who comes back behind you that you're the last one that I've closed. Nice. If you will do that, you're going to have the most remarkable thing ever. Then I do lots of extra jewels and whatever they want. Instead of taking 30 seconds, I take, you know, four minutes and do something nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So usually they're happy. You know, I get some parents. But the problem is even at that, in this kind of a situation, it wouldn't have made any difference because the other people just go, well, we're just going to wait in the line anyway. Mm. And I can't see them because they're down. So in this, uh, this one particular situation, I saw a bunch of security guards walking past. And I walked over and I said, we've got a problem. Yeah. I'm telling you, you're going to have fist fights because I can't see the end of this line. I can't break it off. I mean, it was something I knew I couldn't do on my own because I've been there before in these small things where, so luckily the security people came back at the, for the last 45 minutes and stood there with, you know, guns. I feel it's appropriate. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> that's how you really end a line is you put somebody with guns at the end of the yes. line. That, that's how you do it. A bazooka. <laughs> Cannon if you have it. That's right. And you banish it around and say, no, just, you cannot come. Of course, they, I don't know that they even had guns, but I felt that that would have been appropriate. I think, oh, I think they might have been armed. Come to think of it. <laughs> it. It is always the parents, unfortunately. It is. Do you have some advice for the beginner, someone just starting out face painting? Practice every day. Go download a bunch of pictures on the internet, which by the way, never ever use those at a professional gig because you do not own the rights for them. So the problem is, is because I'm well known and my art's well known and those photos that are floating around the internet are well known. Mm. Um, you're bound to get some of my students and friends and so forth tripping past you when you're at your little festival working and they're going to go, isn't that Lily Walter stuff? Ah. You are totally unethical. You should be hung. You're a bad person. You're evil. <laughs> so, and you know, anyway, that happens a lot. So I tell people, please, please, please take them, download them. Yes. And then every day, print off some blank faces. Let Google be your friend. Blank face. And then just try to do it. And you've got to do it every day because it's, when you're in the thick of it, and you've got to get that kid in and out of your chair in three minutes. You've just got to be fast. And however yeah. fast you are, it's like I just found out last week, I had to be faster. Didn't matter how fast I was, I had to be faster. Mm. And I've been doing it a long, long time. So one, practice all the time. Two, try to take a class. But no matter how many classes you take, take of, you know, come to my boot camp in Las Vegas. But no matter how many you take, <laughs> if you don't work every day at it, it set yourself a 15-minute goal. You know, pretend like you just painted three little kids' faces. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just, you're not going to get good. There's, there's no way you're going to be good if you don't set yourself that goal. And one of the things that I do when I practice is I will actually set a timer. 
for 15 minutes or 30 minutes because uh, sometimes it seems like two minutes is too long and sometimes it seems like two hours is not long enough. Right, right. So if you set that alarm, you know, you'll be able to do it. Okay, how about some advice for the, um, uh, for the working pro? Somebody who's been doing it for a while. Yeah, you know, marketing, <laughs> it's, the, it's the marketing. It's get out and get among, among them. I think the best advice I ever heard, and it's from my professional speaking days, where one speaker said to me, it's better to be doing something for nothing than nothing for nothing. Hmm. So if you're a professional and your calendar isn't full, go out and do it for free, but get out there and get among them. So grab, make yourself up a little mini kit and go into a pizza parlor, buy a meal, buy a meal and go sit off in a corner. And I promise you all of a sudden a bunch of kids are going to come over. You betcha. There'll be that nice line. You'll have to get an armed guards to stop it. Well, you know, and, and you have to just say, Hey, I'm just here practicing. And um, people always ask me, well, wouldn't the management mind that? And I say, they don't mind when people bring their laptop in and do their work. Hmm. You know, and that you're trying to keep people there and keep playing on their games and everything they have in their pizza parlor. Trust me, they're happy. I'm sure. Normally, I ask here for a book, but I'm going to ask you for two recommended books. One speaking and one uh, one for face painting. And they can be your own, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Speak and Grow Rich is the, the most, it's still kind of the Bible of the of the industry. Mm-hmm. So, if it's it's a good book. I'm very proud of it. It came out. We did two versions of it, um, and it's it just kind of kind of goes over everything you're going to need. And let me sum it up for you: marketing, marketing, marketing. Mm. You've got to do it yourself. Yep. But it gives you a lot of tips and ideas. For face painting, the best book I've ever done is my boot camp in a book. It's also the most expensive one because mm. I found that when I was doing the boot camp, even though I had two full days with people, it wasn't enough. And so I put everything I wanted to be able to tell you about making it in the professional face painting world into that. And it's a downloadable ebook. So it's every page filled with full color photos. And you get it immediately. Right. You get it right now, this minute. So my website. Yeah. Anything you want to plug, any social media, give it to us right now. Well, let's see. On Facebook, if if, you know, if you want to be a professional Facebook, uh, Facebook, if you want to be a professional professional face painter, go to look up Lily and Lily is spelled L I L L Y. Three L's. Yes, indeed. Tips and tricks, but face painting tips and tricks. Look that up because I put all of these tips and tricks for professionals, like, you know, four or five times a week. I find all kinds of interesting things, either that I've done or sometimes that my friends have done. And I put those up for you. So that's a good source for you to sit there and go, Oh, look at that great idea and how to do this bunny and whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then the website where I've got all those books and you can buy them is fun rhymes with sun is in other words, F is in Frank fun. Mm-hmm. facepainting.com and just click on the link for books. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks, Lily. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Thank you. This has been great fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been such fun. And I'm so glad we met. <laughs> thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, spread the word. You can reach me from my Facebook page. Just shoot me out a message. And while you're there, join my Facebook group at the Variety Arts Community, where you can participate in our marketing Monday. On the first Monday of every month, I'll create a post called Marketing Monday. You can post your most difficult entertainment uh, marketing challenges there as a comment. If I have an answer for you, I'll answer. But more importantly, we have hundreds of wise minds in the Variety Arts community group. If you know the solution, by all means, let us know. Tell us. Oh, thanks, Lily, for hanging out. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored. (laughs) I'm honored to have you on. Oh, thank you. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.